for them to meditate, it means to become familiar with. So as you become familiar with those thoughts, you become conscious of how you speak, you become aware of how you act, you notice how you're feeling. The more conscious you become of those unconscious programs, the less unconscious you'll go in your waking day. I think if you teach people the what and the why, then the how gets easier because, because it becomes practical. And when people understand the what and the why, um, they assign meaning to what they're doing and they switch on their prefrontal cortex. That, that executive function in the brain actually dampens down the circuits that has nothing to do with anything else but that single-minded thought, right? So, so when you understand the what and the why and there's nothing left to conjecture, to superstition, to dogma, to spirituality, that science is the contemporary language that we use to demystify mystify the mystical. So when that person stands on the stage and they're telling their story and they're the example of truth, they're, they're speaking truth, right. right? So they've actually applied those principles that were once philosophical, theoretical, um, that was basically knowledge and the application, the personalization, the demonstration created an experience. Experience is really what changes us because it enriches the circuitry in the brain, but the end product of an experience is an emotion, right? And mm -hmm. Emotion is what teaches our body chemically to understand what our mind intellectually understood. I look out in the audience and, and people are leaning in. They're looking at truth. They're looking at an example of truth. That is the four minute mile. That's somebody who broke through a level of consciousness or unconsciousness yeah. that says that we can heal by thought alone. So what is the what is the science behind that? So when we started bringing in reputable scientists, people that are well published, that spend their life studying uh, microbiology and cellular function and epigenetics and, and uh, brainwave function and, 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 and all these other different elements. Uh, thousands of metabolites uh, on a cellular level that could be secreted. We're looking very specifically when we, when we did these studies. So we started studying everything and we started looking at brains and we started looking at hearts. And then we started noticing that people would have these very, very, very transcendental moments where there was a significant arousal that took place in their brain. Mm -hmm. And that arousal, which is typically based in fear, in anger or aggression or in pain, that's a survival response. This arousal was, was ecstasy. This arousal was bliss. So the amount of energy in those people's brains during that moment of, uh, and the only way that I could describe it is connection, that moment uh, produced such a level of energy in the brain that it was hundreds of times normal. And this is being measured. You're we're, doing the brain scans. We're right? measuring it in real time. Right, exactly. And then when we see these very, very high degrees of energy in the brain at the same time, we're seeing a high level of order. Now, not just a little order, not a lot of order, like a supernatural amount of order. So um, if you're late for an appointment, mm -hmm. you got to pick your kid up. Mm -hmm. There's 10 texts you have to answer and something went wrong at the office. The arousal of the stress hormones uh, mm -hmm. causes us to move into that primitive nervous system of survival. Mm -hmm. And when we're in stress, we're trying to control, we're trying to predict, we're trying to organize our life because th that unknown is uh, oh, something can go wrong. It's unpredictable. So we shift our attention to one person, to another meeting, to another place we have to go, another time, another thing we have to do. And every single one of those elements has a neurological network in our brain because you've experienced your wife, you've experienced your coworker, you experience your, you know, your pain in your back, your cell phone, whatever. You have a relationship with everything physical or material. And it's mapped neurologically in the brain. In fact, the, neo the neocortex is really a record of the past, right? So the arousal of those stress hormones causes us to shift our attention to all of these different elements and we activate those circuits. And like a lightning storm in the clouds, the brain starts firing very incoherently. And when the brain is incoherent, we're incoherent. Mm -hmm. when the brain isn't working right, we're not working right. At the same exact time, you're sitting in traffic, you can't really run, there's nowhere to run, you can't really fight, there's no one to fight, and uh, you know, you can't really hide. And so the arousal of this primitive nervous system causes the heart, its rate to increase and a respiratory rate to increase because that was the mechanism of survival if you're being chased by T-Rex you better increase your heart rate and your respiratory rate. So now the heart rate and the respiratory rate are increasing, but you're not running, fighting and hiding. There's a physiological change in your body for emergency. Yeah. And you're taking all this vital energy that you would use for growth and repair for long-term building projects. And you're tapping all the body's resources and you're turning it and converting it into chemistry, right? So now the heart is racing, but you're not using that energy. So it's pumping against a closed system and it causes the heart to start firing very incoherent. 
coherently. And that's when you stop trusting. That's when you stop loving. That's when you stop communing. That's when you stop cooperating. Uh, that's when you stop really creating or thinking about possibilities. It's not a time to learn, not a time to go within. And so people spend the majority of their time living in the state. And in that aroused state, those chemicals heighten our senses. And we narrow our focus on the material world because that's where the danger is. If something's behind the big rock and you hear it moving and it's dark at night mm -hmm. and you're walking, you're going to freeze mm -hmm. and you're going to narrow your focus and the arousal is going to heighten your senses. Mm -hmm. And that kind of narrow focus becomes habituated when people live mm -hmm. in constant stress. Now, we talked about this one on one of the yeah. shows we were on and you can turn on that response just by thinking about your problems. Mm -hmm. So now your the arousal of those chemicals becomes almost like an addiction. You actually, and you need the, you need mm -hmm. the familiar stimulus Mm -hmm. to reaffirm that 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 emotional state right because that's how we feel alive so we thought wow what if we teach people how to go from that narrow focus to broadening their focus and opening their focus and focusing on nothing material or physical mm -hmm. and when we did that by sensing space by sensing nothing opening and broadening their focus those different compartments of the brain that were firing out of order incoherently started to synchronize now what sinks in the brain links in the brain. And all of a sudden, the person starts to feel more like themselves. There's an integration. Those people are trying to create a new personal reality as the same personality, and it doesn't work. You literally have to become someone else. So the principle in neuroscience says that nerve cells that fire together, wire together. You keep thinking the same way, making the same choices, demonstrating the same habits, uh, creating the same experiences that stamp the same networks of neurons into the same patterns, all for the familiar feeling called you. And you do that for 10 years on end, you're going to begin to hardwire certain patterns in your brain that becomes your identity. And by the time we're 35 years old, it kind of becomes fixed, right? And psychology used to say that you can't change that, but we now know that you can. So then that kind of box in the brain, that is the habit of ourselves. It's a, yeah, we're 95% of the time running a series of programs. So then sitting and doing the work, we have to become disentangled from those programs. And so the moment you decide to do something differently or make a new choice, what most people don't want to face is that discomfort. And that discomfort, that, that uncertainty, that lack of predictability, the, that unknown, is what people are afraid of because they'd rather live in guilt. At least they can predict who they're going to be than take a chance in possibility. So when a person begins to understand this and you say, well, how long have you been this way? And they say, I've been like this for 35 years. And you say, why 35 years? Because 35 years ago, I had this one event. Well, the stronger the emotion you feel from reaction from that event, the more altered you feel inside of you, the more the brain narrows its focus and freezes the image and takes a snapshot. And that's called a memory, right? So then forget the memory, just overcome the emotion because it's the emotion that keeps you anchored to the past. So that sounds really good theoretically. But when you step out into that unknown, into that void, the body really is in a habit. And what a habit is when the body becomes the mind. Or if you're thinking about that past event and it's producing an emotion, well, you need an image and a feeling to start the conditioning process. So the body's either conditioned into the familiar past or it's hardwired in the predictable future because it wakes up every single day and runs through the same series of routine actions. So the present moment then becomes the unknown. When people start feeling that discomfort, Jay, they'd rather get on their cell phone and call someone or get up and say, I can't meditate or, you know, I, I have too much to do. They excuse themselves. They return back into that familiar feeling because the body's actually telling the brain. The habit is when the body becomes the mind. So the body's stepping out into the unknown and says, ooh, I'd rather feel guilty. I'd rather feel unhappy than be in this discomfort. So then at least then when they return back to that familiar feeling, then they feel safe. So they step out in the unknown and the body starts influencing the mind saying, you can start tomorrow, you're too busy, it's your mother's fault, you know, it's your culture's fault. I don't have enough money. This isn't going to work. Those are the programs in there that are standing in the way between you and your future. So then nerve cells that no longer fire together, no longer wire together. So the act of observing those states of mind and body means you're no longer the program. You're the consciousness observing that program. So, so then to meditate, it means to become familiar with. 
So as you become familiar with those thoughts, you become conscious of how you speak, you become aware of how you act, you notice how you're feeling. The more conscious you become of those unconscious programs, the less unconscious you'll go in your waking day.